Now, I bid you welcome to our Bible class today, and we welcome as well our webcast viewers. We pray that the Lord will come and touch our hearts as we gather before Him. Matthew 5, let's read two verses there, please. Matthew chapter 5, and verses 27 and 28. Matthew 5, 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already heart. Now the Lord here refers to the seventh commandment. That is the one on which we're focusing at the moment, last Sunday and then again today. Well, the Lord <coughs> is of great importance in that He shows to us, as we read it today, that the seventh commandment has a bearing upon the inward man as well as the outward man. There is the plain commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery. It was being said by some in the Lord's day that that's all that there was to it, uh, simply a, a command, a prohibition with regard to the outward act of adultery. But the Lord wants to make it clear that it is much deeper and much more uh, powerful than the outward act of adultery, the physical relationship. So he's explaining, he is expounding the commandments right through this chapter, Matthew 5, and he deals with the seventh commandment here, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, last week I showed you that the basic purpose of this seventh commandment is to protect the marriage institution as ordained by God. But the thrust of the commandment has a wider scope, as I've already indicated by my opening remarks, a wider scope. And much Scripture, many related Scriptures, make this very, very clear. This was understood by godly men in the past, whenever they drew up their confessions and the catechism, the shorter catechism, the larger catechism, they saw very clearly that the, all the commandments, of course, have a wider scope than the mere bare statement, thou shalt not commit adultery, or whatever one we consider. The shorter catechism says, in answer to question 71, what is required in the seventh commandment? The seventh commandment requireth the preservation of our own and our neighbor's chastity in heart, speech, and behavior. Uh, this is important because the framers of the Catechism understood that the matter of uh, chastity, moral purity, begins in the heart. And if the heart is chaste, then so will speech and behavior be chaste also. When you think about what they say here, it requires the preservation, that is the seventh commandment of our own and our neighbor's chastity in heart, speech, and behavior. They, what they say here about the requirement of the seventh commandment makes it clear that they understood, and we must understand this, that if our hearts are not right this way, then we will affect other people. We will influence other people. And of course, we'll see more about that a little later here in this study. Then, number 72, what is forbidden in the seventh commandment? The seventh commandment forbiddeth all unchaste thoughts, words, and actions. <clears throat> and again, the order is very significant. The prohibition begins with thoughts and proceeds to words and actions. And so they are reflecting what the Lord says here about the thought life. Uh, that is in Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Yes, there is the basic command, thou shalt not commit adultery. But the Lord says, whoso looketh on a woman to lust after her. And he's dealing there with the thought life He's dealing with the inward uh, parts. He's dealing with the heart of man. And he's showing us a fallen heart. And he's showing that God's law is broken within the heart, within the mind, uh, even before it is committed, uh, or before the sin comes in the outward act. It is committed right within the soul itself. So the seventh commandment forbids immorality in every area where it may be committed, that is, in thought, in word, and in deed. And it forbids it with regard to the physical aspect of immorality, not only in terms of violating the marriage, 
but in other areas as well. The seventh commandment has a far-reaching radius with regard to even the physical violation of this prohibition uh, against adultery. It has a wide, wide range and it does bring in other areas as well. Now, I want to talk to you about a certain word that's found in the New Testament. It is the word pornea. Pornea. It's a noun. It's used 26 times in the New Testament. It means fornication. There are other words that are related to this basic noun, pornea. There is, for example, the word pornos, which is a masculine form, and it signifies a man who indulges in fornication, a fornicator, in other words, someone who's given over to that vile sin. And then there is the verb, uh, pornuo, which means to commit fornication. And there's a stronger form of that verb, which signifies to give yourself up to this particular sin. And so the New Testament uses this basic word, pornea, and then there are related words, and they're all within the parameters of what God is saying when He says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. When I say those words, they are great words, and uh, you hear them, you will recognize right away that from that Greek word pornea, or even the word for a fornicator, pornos, you get the English words pornography and pornographer. And that, of course, uh, those words are associated with that sordid realm of making profit by means of the production of vile and immoral graphics and movies. And the, the whole uh, pornography industry is a large one. It, uh, I don't know the details but uh, in terms of the money they make, but I know it's, you're talking about billions of pounds or dollars on a yearly basis right across the face of this world as these men churn out their filth and they uh, pollute the minds of multitudes uh, through pornography. Of course, it's a big, big problem now on the internet. Uh, it's a big, big problem with regard to uh, the iPhone or all these different gadgets that people have because when you're look, hooked up to the internet with your phone, uh, you only have to tap in. And this is a big problem among young people. And it's something that parents need to take note of because there is a field out there that young people are now exploring. And it is, of course, soul destroying, mind destroying. And parents need to make sure that their children, their young people are not involved. But the problem is, the situation is, multitudes are. And multitudes are within our own little land and many within our own denomination. This is reality. These are facts that we need to focus on and think about as we consider this very word, pornea, and what it means, what it actually signifies, and the English equivalent, pornography. Now, what I want us to do at this stage is look at how this word is used in the New Testament, because it is employed in a number of ways in relation to various sins of an immoral kind. And in this way we'll see something of the scope of the seventh commandment. We will see how its prohibition is wide and what it actually covers. So I want you to go through this with me carefully because it's very important that we understand this matter of, of how this word pornea is actually used. First of all, it is used of a moral behavior on the part of married people. Now, there are cases where the word is distinguished from adultery. And we will see that. I mean, adultery itself in the usual sense of the word. And when I say the usual sense, what the commandments actually say, thou shalt not commit adultery, we saw last week, it is a commandment that protects marriage. And uh, in that basic fundamental sense, adultery is the uh, guilt of someone within a marriage, either the husband or the wife, uh, committing adultery with somebody else outside of that marriage, obviously. So basically it has that sense to it. There are a few places where it's, uh, it stands for adultery. Uh, it's distinguished from adultery in a few places, this word pernia. 
Uh, for example, Matthew 15, verse 19, it says, Therefore out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications. And so we find that the word for fornication is distinguished there from adultery. But then if you look at Matthew 5, where we read earlier, Matthew 5, verse number 32, it says, I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, and this is the word pornea, causeth her to commit adultery. And the word for adultery in Greek is a different word completely from this word for fornication. So Matthew 5, 32, the Lord distinguishes between the word for fornication and the word adultery. But what he is actually showing here in this verse is that in this case, it stands for adultery. It stands for it. Read the verse again. Whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, divorced committeth adultery. The whole area of marriage and divorce comes up here, but what I want you to see from this verse is that in this verse there is a reference to immoral behavior on the part of the married and is brought under the word pornea. So pornea does refer at times to adultery with regard to the marriage bond. There is the basic word that's in that verse, but fornication is an equivalent. So please get a hold of this. The word for fornication, pornea, is used here with regard to adultery within the, or on the part of someone who is in the married realm. Then turn to 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2. And we're tracing how the word pornea is used in the New Testament. We're finding it does refer to adultery within the marriage. Not only is there the basic word, but pornea is used in that realm as well. So 1 Corinthians 7, we looked at these two verses last week. We'll come back to look at them again. It says, Now concerning the things, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 7, Concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, It is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication, Here's the word, pornea. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now the second verse, verse 2, uses the word fornication in the light of the statement in verse 1. The statement in verse 1 is, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now obviously the reference is to contact of an immoral kind, a sexual kind. Paul now calls it fornication in verse 2. And he said in order to avoid that sin, there should be marriage. That's the drift of his argument. That's the clear uh, thought that he's laying down here. He says, it's good for man not to touch a woman. That, as I say, is not merely touching her, putting your, your hand on her, your finger on her arm or something, you're maybe expressing sympathy and you put your arm around someone and say, I'm, uh, maybe someone close to you, a lady whom you know and you can feel free to do that. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking here about a touch that leads on to immorality. That opens up the door. And then he says, to avoid that, to avoid that fornication, people should get married. That's the basic teaching here. But notice the point. The inference is that those in verse 1 who are engaging in what Paul says is not good to do are unmarried people. So here's the word fornication in its basic sense, the word pornea. When there is the commission of this sin of fornication, it also refers to unmarried people engaging in immoral behavior. And Paul says, to prevent that, God has ordained marriage. So we find a second use of the word pornea in the New Testament. It refers to immoral behavior between the unmarried, young fellows, young girls. And the Lord says here, to prevent that, then there should be be marriage or marriages ordained by God for the purpose of preventing that kind of sin. Thirdly, and we say in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, it says, it is reported commonly 
that there is fornication among you. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Now what's in view here is incest. So here's the word pornea now used with regard to that kind of immorality, incestuous relationships. The reference here is to that atrocious sin of a man actually marrying, and the person here is his stepmother. Notice the last words of verse number 5, that one should have his father's wife. Now, in the New Testament, indeed in the Old Testament, marriage is indicated by that term, to have a woman. Uh, it refers to marriage. It's a, it's a biblical synonym for the word marriage. And so that's what Paul's talking about here, where it says that one should have his, mother, his father's wife. It is a reference to a marriage between uh, a young man, or whatever age he is, and his father's wife. Now that language, his father's wife, means that the woman here is not his own mother. It is his stepmother. So it deals with that kind of situation, and this was happening in the church at Corinth. As what Paul says, it is reported commonly that there is pornea among you, fornication. And he identifies it, where there's this incestuous relationship between the son of a certain man and that particular man's wife, and that is the stepmother of the young man who marries this woman. It is indeed a verse that tells you, that shows you the kind of world in which Paul lived and the kinds of situations that he had to face. And we should pay heed to this. We think things are bad in our day, and they are. But you must understand that human nature has never changed. Human nature has always been this way. These sins have always been around. I think it's simply because of technology in our day that they're much more public. And they're much more brazen in the sense that they can, they can project their wicked lifestyle blatantly and openly and, and, and uh, in a fashion that everybody knows about it, so to speak. But it's not something new. And so here we find the word pernea. And I, I, I'm showing you how it's used. It's used with regard to as an equivalent of... Uh, the word adultery, we saw that in Matthew, is used with regard to uh, sexual impurity between young people who aren't married, is used here with regard to this matter of incest. Now, incest is a wide-ranging problem in our day, very, very wide. And that's all I need to say. News, media are continually telling about this, that, and the other situation where incest has taken place, but it's covered by this word. Then turn to Jude, verse 7, the book of Jude, verse number 7. And here we read these words, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Here's the word fornication used in relation to sodomy. In relation to sodomy. Now the reference is to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. It says here, going after, or giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh. Jude verse 7. Now the word for strange here means other. Other. Other flesh. So you, you could read it. But what it means here in this setting is, this word other, is that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were guilty of entering into physical relationships, but not with the opposite sex, that is, not men with women uh, or uh, women with men, but the very opposite, men with men, women with women. That's what he's talking about. You see, God's ordained basis for marriage in terms of the marriage relationship is that you enter into a, a relationship in marriage with someone who is the opposite sex. That's the basic teaching of the Bible. And so these people in Sodom and Gomorrah were, face, were, were not forming relationships of the kind that God had ordained 
but were forming relationships of a different kind altogether, namely relationships with people of the same sex. That's how we understand the word other in this verse. It says, going after strange flesh. The word for strange is other. I want you to get a hold of this. It's dealing with relationships. The word for other here actually means another of a different kind. But the reference is to relationship. They were forming relationships of a different kind from that which God had ordained. They were marrying or entering into relationships with people of the same sex. Sound familiar? Same-sex marriage or relationships. Because the word marriage used in that realm is an abuse of the word. We saw last week uh, what the word marry means, even in the English language, the, the vital sense of that word. And you cannot have a marriage between two men. You cannot have a marriage between two women. The law may say that you can, but God says you can't. And that's it. It is time that we said, that the nation said it, and of course it's not going to happen perhaps, but it's time that it was said that sodomy is plain downright wrong because of sin. A sodomite marriage, so-called, is an abomination to God because God has instituted the kind of relationship. And that's what the whole focus here in verse 7 is on. And that's what the word strange signifies. It does mean other. It means another of a different kind. And that's the kind of relationship we're supposed to form. We're suppo I'm supposed to marry a woman. A woman's supposed to marry a man. That's the relationship that God has ordained. But what's happening is, as we are seeing here, in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were not forming relationships of the kind that God had ordained. And so... We find the word pornea, pornea used here of the vile sin of sodomy. Do you see how wide-ranging this word is? This word pornea, because it's a vital word in the New Testament. It actually is a word that covers every kind of sexual impurity. Adultery, between, adultery within the marriage, fornication among young people outside marriage, incest, Sodomy, it's all covered by this one word. And therefore, what we are learning from this is that where it is, since it is equated with adultery back in Matthew, then we are learning that the seventh commandment has a very wide range of application. It just does not refer to the, uh, the, the problem of sexual impurity within a marriage when a man goes after another woman, a husband goes after another woman. It doesn't merely cover that. It does, but it covers far more than that. And we must understand this. God wrote the law concerning the seventh commandment in such a way that we could not be mistaken in what he is saying when he deals with this issue. And therefore, the seventh commandment at its very heart is seeking to promote moral purity and chastity. That's what, chastity, that's what we saw from the, from the uh, catechism. The purity and the chastity of ourselves and our neighbors. It's designed to not only preserve the marriage institution, but this commandment is designed to promote purity right across the board when it comes to these issues. Now, as I said earlier, it begins with the mind. So there has to be purity of mind. We saw that in Matthew 5, where the Lord talks about looking on a woman to lust after her. What he's showing you there is that sin is hatched in the mind first. That's where it begins. James says... In James 1 verse 14, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. The word lust is a word that means desire. It's used in a good way and in a bad way, or it's used with regard to good things and bad things in the New Testament. I could lust for more holiness. That's a good desire. That's a good lust where within your soul you are lusting to be like the Lord. You can use the word that way. 
Because as used of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit lusteth against the flesh. And it's the same word. So, it can be used in a good way, but it's also used in a bad way. So James 1, I mean the bad way in the sense of the whole context. Sin or lust, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death. That is why the mind must be guarded. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 13, gird up the loins of your mind. He's telling the child of God to be careful, to guard the mind, to surround the mind. Now, how do we guard our minds when it comes to this matter of purity of mind? Because we're bombarded from every angle with impurity. So how do we, how do we gird up the loins of our minds? How do we guard our minds against this? Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 and the verse number 8. And here's a good verse to show you how you guard your mind. Because it's with your mind that you actually think, isn't it? What is the mind? The mind is the faculty of thought. And so when you read about, when you read the word think or thought, you are reading about the mind. So look at Philippians 4 verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, and he mentions a number of, of qualities here. Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, here you have it. Think on these things. Which means that you need to feed your mind with these things. Now, if you go down through those qualities, beginning there where it says, whatsoever things are true, and going on through honest and just and so on, where will you find those qualities most? You'll find them in Christ. Christ is the one who is perfectly true, honest, just, pure, lovely. No one more lovely than the Lord Jesus Christ, and so on. So, what Paul's actually saying here is, think about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's really what he's saying when he says, think in these things. Here is what the believer should be thinking about. Now, don't misunderstand me. We need to think about our jobs. You need to think about your family, and I need to think about my family. You need to think about whatever you're doing. You can't hammer in a nail without thinking about it. You've got to use your mind, or you'll miss the nail, won't you? You'll hit, your, hit the wrong nail. So you've got to think. And therefore, when Paul says, think on these things, he's not saying, this is all you think about. What he is saying is, whatever you're doing any day, when you are driving in that nail, when you are painting that wall, when you are standing washing the dishes, and you're thinking about your job and your occupation, let thoughts about Christ also be there. Indeed, let them supersede everything else that you're doing. And that will come about as you wash your dishes and you talk to the Lord in prayer. Or you're driving along in the car and you're thinking about Him even as you're driving and you're saying to yourself, this verse says this and that verse says the other thing. That's what Paul's talking about. Think on these things. Think about Jesus Christ. And as you think about Jesus Christ, then your mind will be purified. Your mind will be preserved. Your mind will be guarded from those things that would intrude. Unsaved, or people who, in their unsaved days, maybe indulged in whatever, will find that memories can come suddenly flood back. Memories of, of the unsaved days and the things that were done, etc. And the Christian's horrified that that kind of thought can suddenly spring up in your mind. So we know what, we're, we know what Paul's talking about in these, uh, these verses where he says, think in these things. Paul understands He's talking here to Philippian Christians. He come out of paganism. And maybe they've got problems with their thoughts. Indeed, may I just say this? When you study the book of Philippians, Philippians focuses on the mind over and over and over again because the Christian has a battle with regard to the mind. And Paul here is not giving the impression that he's super pious. 
He's not saying here that the Christian in general is someone who does not have trouble with bad thoughts, evil thoughts. Uh, the, the believer is a person against whom the devil will fling everything he can and he'll bring up the past and he'll make you think about what you used to do or what you used to say or whatever it may be. He'll make you think about that and he will, he will, dis he will cause your mind to be disturbed. There's a battle for the mind. But the Lord is showing us here, thank God, there's a way of guarding our minds and a way of even purifying our minds. The command is, think on these things. And when it comes to this whole matter of things immoral, as I said earlier, yes, from the world around, from many sources, we are bombarded with immorality and your mind can very quickly be polluted by something that you see or hear because uh, remember that the, the eye and the ear are the gates into the soul. It's through the eye, through the ear that uh, things enter into our thoughts process, into our, into our souls. That's how it gets in and therefore we are bombarded. But there are gates or there are ways of keeping the gates shut, and that is by thinking on Jesus Christ. So there's purity of mind, there's purity of behavior. We must act in a fashion as will not produce impure thoughts in ourselves or in others. I think of what what Job once said. Whenever Job was going through his trial and he's been accused of all kinds of things by his companions, including, perhaps, Job, you have committed adultery. Job said this, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? I made a covenant with my eyes. Job realized his danger sometime in the past. That man who walked with God Realizing the corruption of his own heart and the danger that lay there, he says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? In other words, he's saying, what you're charging me with, you're charging me with is completely unfounded, unjust, because that's one sin I haven't committed. That's what he's saying. For he says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look on a maid. Now, do you see from Job's words that even in his day, this whole issue of, of uh, the eye being the gate of the soul along with the ear was understood. And he also understood that there were areas where he could have been tempted and led astray, but he made this covenant with his eyes. I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to look at a beautiful young woman in the sense of looking at her in the wrong manner. Again, understand what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that you can't uh, see a, a beautiful young woman and say she's very pretty or something like that. She looks nice. There's nothing wrong with that. But when it goes beyond that, that's what Job's talking about. He says, I made a covenant with my eyes. And so there must be purity of mind and there must be purity of behavior. We must act in a fashion and gird ourselves in a fashion that we will not be led astray. Now, that calls for a number of things. It calls for carefulness in dress. And it's not that the Bible gets at women, but there certainly is more of an emphasis in Scripture on the dress of the woman than there is in the dress of the man. Why is that? Well, I've touched on it. Job gives us the answer. The way a man is made, it's through the eye, through the look, that he is tempted. Therefore, a woman needs to be very careful how she dresses so that she will not become a snare to weak man. But that's the way it is. And, and this is taught everywhere through, I mean, when I say everywhere, it's taught widely throughout Scripture. And therefore, a woman is commanded to dress in a certain way uh, so that she will not be a temptress. In Proverbs 7, just to take the words 
the, the writer Solomon talks about the attire of an harlot. And he's talking about improper dress. And he's saying that it's provocative. It's really what he's saying, the attire of a harlot. It's how she dresses. That's how she plies her trade. That's how she gets her customers, just to put it bluntly, by the way she dresses, the way she appears, the attire of a harlot. And so, since that's the example the Bible uses, because if you read Proverbs chapter 7, where those words are found, you'll find that Paul was watching a young, or not Paul, Solomon was watching a young man one night who left his house, went down the street, and there was a harlot on the street, and she had the attire of a harlot, and it says he went like an ox to the slaughter. Because when he saw her, her provocative dress, the attire of the harlot, he was led astray. Now, I'm not saying that all women dress like that, but what I am saying is, what the Bible is saying is, women need to be careful how they dress. And especially Christian women within the church of Jesus Christ. And it is it's important that mothers teach their, ch their, young, their daughters how to dress. It's important that they tell them, get those hemlines down and those necklines up. That's important, mothers. You need to teach your daughters how to dress. Because uh, obviously, because we're all sinners, men and women, young women or older women, can be guilty of dressing improperly, and they find that their hearts, if they're not guarded, like that. They like to dress that way because they get the eye of the fellows. And God forbids that. We have to be honest, folks. This is a wide-ranging commandment. Carefulness in dress, carefulness in speech. In Ephesians, I know the time's nearly gone here again, but in Ephesians chapter 5, look at what Paul says in verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as become of saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And he's talking to the Christian church, and he says, don't let these things even appear among you in what you actually say. And he mentions fornication, and he mentions uncleanness. And verse 4, he talks about filthiness and, uh, and foolish talking. And he's dealing with immoral speech. And he's telling God's people, it mustn't cross your lips. We've heard of people who profess to be Christians, and, and it has been said their, their talk was on the line, or their talk was bordering on whatever, and that should never be. But you see, Paul is showing us how our hearts must be guarded, and our minds must be guarded, and our speech, and our dress, and so on. And so, this commandment does promote moral purity and chastity as the rest of the Word of God, or so much of the Word of God goes on to show and to reveal to our hearts and our minds. But closing today, thank God there's pardon for the violation of the seventh commandment. Now, the history of man is a catalogue of failure with regard to this commandment. The Bible shows this, church history shows this. The point is that of all the commandments, man has never found the seventh easy to obey. Why? Because man has fundamental God-given desires with regard to physical intimacy, desires that are not wrong in themselves. But because man has fallen, those legitimate desires are perverted abused, and they leave untold misery. These are facts, folks. Man has legitimate desires. God made men and women to come together in marriage. He made the physical intimacy of marriage a blessing and a wonderful thing. And therefore, there's that basic desire for it. But you see, because we're fallen creatures, our fallen nature has abused it and perverted it. So there's something within our hearts that's a desire that's right, and yet it has, been it has been distorted because of sin. And this is why this commandment 
is dealing with an issue that has been such a problem down through time and still is. But there's pardon for this sin. And furthermore, there's power over this sin so that people can walk with God. Thank God there's pardon. That's 1 Corinthians 6, isn't it? Such were some of you, mentioning adultery, fornication, sodomy, and so on. He says, so, such were some of you, but now you're washed and you're sanctified and you're justified. There's pardon for it. But then Galatians 5, where Paul says, the spirit lusteth against the flesh. By the power of the Holy Ghost, we can know victory over these unlawful desires that arise because of the fallen heart of man. And may God help us today as we think about this commandment. We'll leave it there, and we trust and pray that the Lord will use His Word and bless His Word to our souls, and that He will help us as we deal with these matters in everyday life and in our own experience. And may God come and keep us and guard us for His glory. So let's just bow in prayer. Lord, we pray this day that the Spirit of God will take the things of God and write them on our souls and bless them to us. We pray that Thou wilt give grace in a wicked day, day of great immorality. And, O oh Lord, keep us under the shadow of Thy wing and bless us, we pray. Lead us closer to Thy side and grant us help by the Holy Spirit. We look to Thee. We wait in Thee. Be with us right through this day. And May thy name be glorified. We pray this for Jesus' sake and for his eternal praise. Amen.